What does it mean to be skeptical? What does it mean to cast doubt on something you feel is not right, despite popular consensus? What does one refer to when judging whether something is real or not? The good news is that each and every one of us are natural born skeptics. One of the first words we learn is why. Spend an afternoon with a two year old and you'll find yourself answering that question ad infinitum. But as we grow older, we can become desensitized to the whys in the world and accept things at face value so long as we see other people doing so. If we asked as many questions as a two-year-old, we would never get to work on time. The easiest thing to do is to see if other people have accepted something as a truth, since most likely someone has verified it before and the consensus is the validation of that. The problem with this line of reasoning is that it produces a herd mentality. Yes, it saves time for us and allows us to get through the day, but it can fool us into thinking that we are all participating in the collective experience of reality. So how does one maintain a healthy level of skepticism without questioning the crispiness out of a bowl of cereal? With prior probability, which I'll explain later. Skepticism is more than just asking why. The strength of skepticism is revealed when it precedes a claim. Once the claim is made, then the skeptic's question is, what is the proof of this claim? In this respect, skepticism is the cognitive doorman between reality and fantasy. It separates the idea of the claim from the reality of the claim. What tools does a skeptic use to discern the two? Critical thinking and the scientific method, which aims to verify a claim by carefully examining it under objective testing methods, or as close to one can get. Subjecting a claim to scientific testing requires many test subjects. The more the better, because if you test something just once, or only a few times, you may get an inaccurate result. Sort of like pulling five people off the street at random and finding that all of them have blue eyes, and then concluding that everyone has blue eyes. When you take a large sampling, the numbers begin to even out or regress to the mean. When testing the claim against something properly, using objective measures, like Pepsi tastes better than Coke, the testing must be done using what is called a double blind model. Both the person conducting the test and the subjects don't know which is the Pepsi and which is the Coke. This is the best way of removing any subjectivity from the test. Another way to remove subjectivity is to use a third party tester. If Pepsi was financing the test, it would show an inherent bias towards Pepsi. So a third party is used for just such a reason. For a claim such as this to be confirmed, it has to show a result of more than would have naturally occurred. Since there is a 50-50 chance of choosing Coke over Pepsi, then the result would have to be greater than 50% to conclude that Pepsi does in fact taste better than Coke. So if the Pepsi challenge was conducted using a double blind trial and administered by a third party over a large population of people and 75% voted in favor of Pepsi, then you can safely conclude that Pepsi is generally more favored than Coke. The skeptic can't be expected to conduct a Pepsi challenge whenever confronted with a claim. This is impractical and it would make it very difficult to get anything done in a day. This brings us back to the earlier point about prior probability. When confronted with a claim, first ask yourself this basic question. How likely is the claim? This is where critical thinking comes in. You have to subjectively decide if it is plausible given the weight of the claim. For example, the claim that Count Chocula cereal stays crispy in milk would rank very high on the plausibility scale. Not only that, but there is little consequence if it's true or not. If you can get through the majority of the bowl of cereal without having it turn mushy, it pretty much settles the matter. But now the claim that extraterrestrials are forming intricate crop circles in farmers fields is a very heavy claim with an extraordinary low probability. Considering that there is absolutely no hard evidence for UFOs coupled with a long history of UFO hoaxes, one would do well to be very skeptical of the crop circle claim. The evidence for such a claim would have to be very high. So how do you judge evidence then? Evidence can be categorized into five types. Intuition, basically reading subtleties. Personal experience. Testimonial, aka endorsement. Anecdotal evidence, which is sort of inferred from other evidence, so it may be untrue. And scientific evidence, which documents the hits and misses independently verifies it under rigorous conditions and retains and builds on the verified. 
putting these types of evidence into practice. When a claim is made about the weather, such as, it's raining outside, personal experience with the weather informs you that it's highly plausible that it's raining. You might even consider testimonial evidence, such as, an employee tells you it's raining outside. But if you were told it's raining frogs outside, that's when you must appeal to scientific evidence, as personal experience does not apply, and testimonial evidence is not sufficient given the weight of the claim. As it stands, the scientific method is the best tool we have at testing reality because it strives for an objective and continually testable platform to test against. Scientific evidence remains continually open for challenge as the goal is for the objective truth, even if it means disproving an accepted scientific truth. This is a strength, not a weakness. It is a fallacy to think a heavy claim might be valid because science could be wrong, since this is a moot point. The fact that the claim failed under scientific scrutiny means, according to the best means of discerning reality that humans can conceive, the claim has failed. The claim may then appeal to a lesser form of evidence, but since all other testing methods rely heavily on subjectivity, such as testimonial evidence, they are prone to inaccuracies and fail to record the negatives along with the positives. The reason why subjective evidence is unreliable is because it can't be verified properly. Since any claim can be produced in the mind, to subjectively validate it keeps it within the mind. Since we are testing whether or not it is actually the truth, the only way to do this is to subject it to reality, thus objective scientific testing. If a claim is made that seems to have a low plausibility and the only evidence being offered is testimonial, you may infer that it has failed under scientific testing. Consider the following list a crash course on common claims that have failed under proper scientific scrutiny. Homeopathy, Reiki, Magnetic Healing, Applied Kinesiology, Iridology, Vertebral Sublocations, meaning having your back cracked by a chiropractor, Acupuncture, Qi, pretty much any form of alternative medicine. Childhood vaccinations causing autism. The plausibility and existence of supernatural entities, such as ghosts, poltergeists, angels, and gods. This includes any and all gods. Creationism, intelligent design, miracles, and the power of prayer. As well as the existence of ESP, telekinesis, psychic powers, and telepathy. And thus the credibility of parapsychology. Any form of spoon bending, tarot card reading, palm reading, fortune telling, astrology, clairvoyance, and dream premonitions. Topics in cryptozoology such as Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, Chupacabra, Mothman, Rod Insects, Yeti, Unicorns, Fairies, etc. Alien visitations, UFOs, crop circles, repressed memories, dowsing, conspiracy theories, and the list goes on and on. No one wants to be called gullible. When all else fails, you must ask yourself, how likely is the claim? Who is informing me of this claim, and is there a chance they could be biased towards it? What natural laws or scientific theories does the claim bend or completely defy in order to be possible? Has real scientific evidence been presented, or does it rely on testimonial evidence or any subjective evidence? Consider this a primer for a greater understanding of reality. It might be difficult at first to look skeptically at a commonly accepted claim or belief system, but you owe it to yourself to find the truth as it is based in reality. The scientific method is our legacy. It is a testament to the need to really know why and to the many great thinkers who came before us and cleared a path through the thick entanglement of superstitions and pseudoscience. It's in our nature to ask why and we develop the discipline of skepticism to make sure our answers are based in reality. Because if our answers aren't based in reality, then they're just bullshit.